morning. All right. Before we get started this morning, there's a couple of things that I wanted to add to the announcements just for a moment. We'll be in the unity service tonight at Southside at 7, uh, but they're also going to have a time of just kind of hanging out, just a fellowship time, and, and they're going to have uh, drinks, and they're asking anybody that wants to come to bring a dessert, and uh, that's at 6 o'clock, and they're going to have a, like a fellowship time. It's a multi-church uh, event. And so there's a lot of different churches there, and it's just a time to hang out and, and, and enjoy each other's company at 6 o'clock. <clears throat> and then at 7 will be the service in the sanctuary there at the south side. <clears throat> and also, on Tuesday night at the Camelsville Chapel will be our, our, our monthly uh, prayer service, and Jeff Hart's going to bring the message there Tuesday night, and that's at 6.30. So remember those things. And uh, no. Uh, because uh, but, but, uh, the, uh, we won't be having Wednesday night services on the grounds of Mount Pleasant this Wednesday night. Everybody's going to be at the pool. And uh, I was asked earlier what kind of bathing suit I suggest wear. This fella, I told him to wear one with as much cloth as he could buy. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and so, uh, uh, but we're going to have our, our services uh, up at the, it's just a pool just as a kind of a, I, I, and a joyous event and just celebrate the Lord and the church and as the kids go back to school. If you bow with me this morning, I want to open us in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, our God and our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we uh, are blessed, blessed beyond our understanding, Lord, just to be here this morning, Lord, in a, in a country where we're free to be here and worship you and, Lord, but the greatest blessing is the fact that you, the God of heaven and earth, the God who spoke the world into existence, your presence is in this room. Father God, your Holy Spirit is here, and I pray that your Holy Spirit can have its way. Lord Jesus, I pray today that your Holy Spirit has its way in me. I pray, Lord, that you'd hide me behind the cross and that, that you would take over my tongue and help me remember the things that I need to say. And Lord, even the things I haven't recalled, Lord, bring them about. Father, thank you for life and hope and joy and and, Lord, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you as Lord, that's the greatest need there could possibly ever be. And I pray, Lord, if there was someone here that doesn't know you as Lord, that today the Holy Spirit would knock on the door of their heart and that they would answer that call. And, Lord, I just pray for all of us, God, that we might open our eyes to the reality of who you are and what you've called us to. Thank you for this day and for the word. And just you know, be with us as we go through this message. And, God, help us to open the eyes of our heart. Let your Holy Spirit open the eyes of our heart that we may see in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to be in the book of 2 Peter. We're going to begin where we ended last week in, the, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, if you want to be finding that in your Bible. and I've said the last couple of weeks, I love the book of 2 Peter and, and, and I especially love the verses that are in the beginning of, chap, of chapter 1. I love the whole book, but, but I love this because uh, Peter is, he, I mean, he's under, he's under death sentence here. I mean, he, he's in prison under Nero. It has been made plain to him in his spirit. His time on this earth is very short. He ain't worried about what nobody thinks about him. He don't care about perfect grammar. He ain't worried about punctuation. He's talking about getting real. And, and, and if somebody asked me to summarize the book of Second Peter, that would be how I would summarize it, that Peter is saying to the church, let's get real. I mean, this is, this is the real thing. Because here's the thing, and, and I know there's many people in this room that know what I'm talking about, but I wish that I could go back and get saved again knowing what I know now about Christ. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and, and I wish I could go back and raise my kids understanding now how precious of an opportunity I had then. I know that sounds crazy, but the reality is, is Peter is at the end of his life understanding the preciousness of faith, and he's in a position where his race is about run. But he's saying to the church, you have such an opportunity to let your faith roll. You have such an opportunity to let God produce great fruit through your faith. And he begins his book, 
and his letter here in Second Peter, and, and this is the part that I, I man, I love this. Part. He's writing to those who, through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, have been given a faith as precious as He is. And man, I, I, you're going to hear that word "precious faith" a few times today. And I hope and pray when you leave here that you may have a greater understanding of how precious your faith is. Because faith should be precious, and it is precious. And it, and, and and Peter understood that. I mean, you. I mean, a dying man, hope in Jesus, begins to understand how precious faith is. You know what I mean? Peter's understanding it at this point in his life more than he ever has before, and and he's saying, now, I, now follow me for a minute. Grace and peace is yours in abundance through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, I asked the early service, and I think they're pretty honest with me. And I'm going to ask you, how many people in this room right now, as a Christian, would have to say that you have let Satan rob you of your peace many times in your spiritual life? Right? I mean, I'm like, Debbie, I'd have to raise both my hands. But, but, but what he's saying is, let's get real, church, because God has gave you grace and peace in abundance through your knowledge of him. I mean, he just gave you enough of it, you can roll around in it. You know what I mean? I mean, he's made it plentiful. And he has given you a very great thing. He has empowered you with everything you need for life and godliness. Now, here's the thing. I want you to wrap your mind around this a minute. Why would God have given us armor and a sword if there wasn't ever going to be a battle? I mean, you kind of look pretty silly, wouldn't you? I mean, armor and a sword works out good on a battlefield, but, it, but, but, but other than that, you'd look weird. I mean, he, he didn't send you to play hopscotch with your sword, you know what I mean? He realized that you were involving when he was putting you in a place of great battle, but he had already empowered you to win that battle. You've been given everything you need for life and godliness. And here's the part that, man, really, it says that, that God, through his precious promise, has let you participate in his divine nature. Now, I've, I've tried to, to explain that in the last couple of weeks, and I want to just touch on that just a minute. Now, now my mom and dad they gave me my fleshly life. And in doing that, they gave me every attribute of the fleshly nature. They got it from their mom and daddy, and they got it from their mom and daddy. And if you trace it back long enough, they got it from old grandpa, Adam. Right? I, I don't know if you know this or not, but if you go back far enough, Adam is your grandpappy. Right? And you got it from him. The whole world inherited a sin root from Adam. God cursed. He didn't just curse Adam. He cursed the human race, everybody that was of Adam's seed. And so I, I have a fleshly nature. Now, my fleshly nature doesn't make me automatically a sinner. It makes me susceptible to sin. Jesus had a fleshly nature and never sinned. You say, oh, yeah, he did. The Bible says he was tempted in every way, yet sinned not. He took on the weakness of sinful man, yet remained perfect, and that made him the perfect sacrifice. But I didn't even get out of the womb good before I messed up. You know I mean, I mean, Jesus done good with it, but I done terrible with it. And the Bible says you did too. So we don't even, I ain't even going to ask you to raise your hand if you messed up. I already know the answer. You, you messed up. Uh, uh, we're sinners, right? I inherited a sin nature, and I am a sinner, and, and so I messed up. I, I, nobody had to teach me how to do bad things. I don't remember anybody ever sitting me down telling me how to lie, but I picked it right up. Right? Nobody taught me how to be sneaky, but I learned it. Come natural to me. Because I'm a sinner. Sin nature. I, and I have participated in the fleshly nature. Now, you, you don't have to raise your hand either because I already know you've done it. 
Bible says you did. You have participated in the fleshly nature. But God, through the Holy Spirit, has gave you rebirth, which means he has allowed you to have the Spirit living in you. All right? The Holy Spirit, God just didn't say, all right, what I want you to do is clean yourself up. Because you can't do it. What he done was gave you regeneration through the Holy Spirit, which God is living in you to clean you up. You, you follow me? And God wants to make you look like Jesus. And he has given you the Holy Spirit to do that. He has allowed you to participate in his... So as much as my parents gave me a fleshly nature, all the attributes of a sinful nature... God has given me a spiritual nature. All the attributes of the Spirit I have been given through the Holy Spirit. And so Peter said, therefore, make every effort to add to your faith. I mean, God's already done this, man. He has set you up. So you make every effort to add to your faith. And then he comes up with this big list of fruits. All right? He got all kinds of fruits in which that we should be adding to our faith. Add to your faith goodness, into your goodness knowledge, into your knowledge self-control, into your self-control godliness, into your, or perseverance, into your perseverance godliness, into your godliness brotherly kindness, and your brother you remember the list brotherly kindness love. And then he says something powerful. We read this last week. If you possess these things, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of Jesus. Now, now I, 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 listen to me one more time. Don't be watching the fly on the wall. Or not. Listen to this. If you have fruit in your faith, it will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your faith. Right? That's what fruit does. But if you don't have fruit in your faith, then you're nearsighted and blind and have forgotten you've been cleansed from your past sin. Now, that's where we stopped last week because he set up two scenarios here. One is you're blind. You have never been enlightened. You're still in your sin. The Holy Spirit doesn't live in you yet. Don't, don't, now, don't say, oh, he's, that man, I've heard this junk so many times. I, l l listen to me for a minute. Being enlightened is a spiritual experience. It is something that God does for you. I won't quote to you a line in the song, I Saw the Light by Hank Williams for a minute. I want you to listen to these words. I was a fool to have wandered and strayed, for straight is the way and narrows the gate. But now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Now I want you to wrap your mind around that for a minute. What happened in that verse? He changed directions. I was a fool to have went that way. Because straight is the way and narrows the gate. But now I have traded the wrong for the right. And the reason is, is I saw the light. You understand? He turned around. What a powerful understanding of what, what repentance means. Repentance does not mean perfection. Repentance means you're headed toward the light. That God has revealed to you the truth of why you exist and the truth of how much he loves you and the fact that he longs to make you into his likeness and you get tired of living for yourself and turn and head toward the light. Now, if I'm headed toward the light, then every step I take is going to make me closer to the light, right? Oh, come on, it don't take no genius to figure that out. I mean, you don't have to be no mental heavyweight. If I'm headed toward the light, every step I take, I'm closer to the light, right? right. You're dang right, that's right. <laughs> and if I'm getting further away from the light, I'm going the wrong way. See, that don't take no genius to figure that out. We want to make Scripture so hard. But if I saw the light and I'm headed toward that light, if I'm dwelling in that light, then I'm closer to the light than I used to be. I tried to say that. Now, now, now we're good. And so if I, am, if I don't have fruit, then one or two things is wrong. Either first of all, I've never saw the light. I've never been enlightened. 
or I have wandered from the path. If my fruit is lacking, something's wrong, something big time wrong. Either I have never saw the light, or I've took my attention off that light and wandered from the path. Now, now he's laying it out here because this, ver this passage of Scripture I'm about to read to you gets people upset. Some people will get red on you because they don't understand what Peter is trying to say. They get all upset. They would call me a works preacher. <gasps> You're a works preacher. But we're going to look at it from a biblical reality instead of some la-la land denominational reality about what God says in his word. So follow with me in 2 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 10 and 11. Peter says, therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you'll never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, he says, make, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. Be sure of your calling and election. Now, here's the thing. Calling and election are both action words, Right? Yeah, that's right. Whose action was it? It weren't yours. God, that's right. God done the electing and God done the calling. Now, if I've got you a little confused, just hang in there for a minute. God done the elected and God done the calling. He's not telling me to make sure God elected me and called me because if God didn't, what in the world could I do about it? Nothing. But the reality is, is I don't have to worry about it because people are not going to hell because God didn't do his part. That's stupid. That is stupid. God elected all who would choose him before the world began. Right? And he called them through the Holy Spirit. Now, if you believe that God only called the people who would answer, then, then you're going to have a major problem with Scripture because he says in Scripture, if you hear the voice calling today, don't be like your forefathers who hardened their hearts in the wilderness. Right? God called a lot of people that didn't answer the call. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you together like a hen gathers a chicks, but you won't let me. See, the problem isn't on that God didn't call. It's on they ain't answering. Right? And, and, and the problem isn't because God didn't choose them. It's because they didn't choose God because he said he chose the whosoevers. He sent his son that whosoever shall. Right? And, and so all of a sudden it's not my job to be working on if, if, if did God elect me? Did God call me? Well, if he didn't, what can I do about it? But he did. He did. So I ain't got to worry about that. I got to be sure of what I've done with that calling and election. That's the part I need to make sure about. I need to make sure about my faith. Now, understand something. Peter wasn't trying to get people who had faith to doubt it. He just told them that they had a faith as precious as his. Right? I mean, he's, he, he isn't trying to get them to doubt it. He's trying to get them to appreciate it, to value this awesome faith. And so here's the thing. Peter's saying to be sure your faith... Now, how do you go about doing that? How do you be sure of it? He just said it by adding to your faith fruit. Fruit, fruit is the proof of faith. What idiot ever walked up to an apple tree with apples on it and said, what kind of tree is that? I mean, you think about that. When it's, bar when, it, when it's hanging with no leaves, no apples on it, you might have questions. You think that's an apple tree or a pear tree? But if you walked up there with some old boy with some, a tree hanging full of big red apples, and he turned around and said, you think that's a pear tree? Are you stupid? I mean, it's got apples on it. Take no mental heavyweight to figure. You don't have to get out your science book to figure this one out, buddy. This is a dang apple tree right here, you know what I mean? Right? Because the fruit is the proof of the faith. And if there's no fruit, then something's wrong with the faith. James said in James chapter 2 and verse 17, faith not accompanied by deeds is dead. 
right? James 2, 7. But should we just listen to that just because James said it? I mean, but, but, but what about John the Baptist? Look, Matthew 3, 8. I'm going to read Matthew 3, 8 through 10. It says, it says this. John the Baptist said, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children of Abraham. The axe is already at the foot of the tree, and every tree that doesn't produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now think about that for a minute. John the Baptist says, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, don't tell me you repented and be fruitless, right? It, it produce fruit with your repentance because he says the axe is already at the foot of the tree and every tree that has no fruit will be what? Cut out and thrown in the fire. Well, that's kind of mean, ain't it? But I didn't say it. God did. And the reality is, is God's not a fake and he, he don't have any patience with fake either. You know, because I can't tell God, hey, God, you're my God and not serve him. And, and, and that's something that our culture is having a hard time with. You ever decide you're going to quit a bad habit? Just pick one out. I'm going to quit it. How easy is that? I mean, it says right on every pack of cigarettes, this product may be addictive. It don't say that on no cookie packages. That ought to be again the law. <laughs> you know what? I mean... Ice cream, don't got it on there. But, that, but, but by gosh, it's hard. Amen? You ain't kidding, it's hard. Because whenever I decide that I'm not going to do something I used to do, my flesh says, oh, please. You know what I mean? You don't love me if you won't let me. It's like a little kid that you just told them they can't have that toy today. It'll throw a fit. Right? And the fact of the matter is, is whenever we have fruit, it doesn't put our flesh in the driving seat anymore. And, and so our fruit is telling our flesh, no, that's where the moral character come in. Add to your faith goodness. That's moral excellence. Add to your goodness knowledge. Now, I don't know about you, but I can sit down in my chair and read any meaningless worldly book and not bother me too bad. But if I pick up the Bible, Satan will suggest a thousand things I could be doing. Why is it so hard to pay attention to the Word of God? Is it not because there's an enemy that don't want you to? I mean, man, you've got to be devoted to that, right? You've got to, be, you've got to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. He wasn't kidding about that deny yourself thing. And so it, what it comes right down to is this fruit is, 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 is the evidence of my faith but because producing fruit is work. The other day we was driving through the field and Emma said, what kind of tree is that? Had big, I said, that's a walnut tree. She said, I thought it was a fruit tree. I said, it is. The fruit of a walnut tree is a walnut. Right? It bears fruit. That's its fruit. Walnuts. What's your fruit? And so James says, you could tell, you could tell about the tree. John the Baptist says, oh, you can tell about the tree. What well, about Jesus in John 15, 1 through 2? He says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. And every branch in me, well, I am the true vine and my father's the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it'll be even more fruitful. Now, this is the words of the master himself. Every branch in me that bears no fruit. Now, man, now, now we're getting right down to the ground. What God is saying is you can't have fruitless faith. Now, this morning you may be saying, oh, Lord, I'm in a jam here. Let me explain something to you. Your faith may go through hills and valleys, hills and valleys. Right? And because... The conditions will oftentimes determine the fruit. But there will be fruit in a Christian's life. Now, I, I, told, I used to have a couple of apple trees in my backyard. Now, I live in a holler. If you ain't around here, that's in a low-lying area. All right, you know what I'm talking about? I live down in the holler. 
And in the holler, my poor little apple trees almost every year was accursed by a late frost. I mean, man, they'd have blooms on them, be the prettiest things you ever, look like a picture out of the Southern States magazine. You know what I mean? I mean, beautiful. And then it'd have, so it, it, we'd have a late frost, and both of them together wouldn't fill up a five-gallon bucket with all the apples that come off of them. I, I mean, there's been several years that way. But there's been years that the conditions was right that you couldn't put what they had made in a pickup truck. Now, I've, I've seen them be hung so full that limbs would break off of them from the weight of the apples. Same tree, same dirt, same everything, except the conditions were different. And there are times in our life, man, when we're hanging full of fruit because our study life's good, our prayer life's good. We're in one of those places where we're really seeking God. We're heading toward the light with great perseverance. There's a lot of fruit. But we might go through another area where the, the, the conditions is lacking a little bit. We kind of shied away from our study. We're not spending the time in the Word like we should. We've let some things infiltrate our mind. We've kind of, we've kind of had a little worldliness getting away, you know. And our, our prayer life has become a wish list again instead of a have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. And, and so th th at that point in our life, it's not that we're lost. Please understand that. It's not that you're lost. It's that you're not headed toward the light in the right direction, right? Now, here's the thing. Peter wasn't saying, oh, you don't have as much fruit as you used to. God's going to write you out. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that if your, if your faith is truly precious, then it's going to be of the utmost importance to you that you be fruitful. And I think right here is the message that has failed to be preached in America. Now, can we put that Matthew 13, 44 passage up on the wall? It says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and in his joy, he went and sold all he had, and he bought that field. Now, think about this for a minute. Back in the day, they didn't have safety deposit boxes up at the bank. The bank wasn't there yet. And so people would take their valuables, and what did they do with them? They buried it. They buried it. And so I took my valuables out, and I buried it. And my mule kicked me in the head and killed me. And I hadn't told Becky where I put this junk. You know what I mean? Never did tell her. Nobody knows. And so back in that day, it would be a common thing to find buried treasure. You understand? Jesus' audience would have understood exactly what he was talking about. Buried treasure. Kind of like that dude that found King Tut's tomb. I mean, look at it. I mean, who, who would be thinking you'd be poking around in rocks and find some uh, king that died at a very young age that was buried in a golden coffin, you know what I mean, with a golden face mask? I, I mean, that's unbelievable, you know? But the reality is, is this was just treasure, somebody's most prized possession. And, G and Jesus says this, the tra kingdom of heaven is like a guy who realizes that there's something in this field worth more than everything else I got. Now think about that for a minute. And so he invest all of himself to get that field. And Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like that when you realize that what is here in, 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 in the presence of God through the Holy Spirit is more valuable than anything I possess or could put my fingers upon in this life. And you devote all of yourself, you invest all of yourself in your faith. And here's the thing, and, and, and I'm going to get you to answer the questions, and so it ain't so hard. It's harder when it comes from me. It's easier when it comes from you, you know? If, if I say that Jesus is Lord, right, but I move him out of first place because mama ain't happy, Becky ain't happy. And so I change my perspective about Jesus for my wife, who's Lord of my life. She is. I don't take no genius to figure that out. So I have let her be in the first position. I've moved Jesus to the second position. So at that place in life, my faith is not my most precious thing. Becky, the Bible says if you love your wife and your children more than you love me, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. So if I put my kids in that position, 
If I change my perspective about, about Jesus for my children, if I change what I believe and where I stand about Jesus for my children, then who's the Lord of my life? My children are. And so all of a sudden, I have took Jesus out of, and hey, I'm still, it's good to love your wife and kids, right? And not everybody that's not got Jesus in first place is necessarily doing a bad thing. It's just Jesus isn't the Lord of their life. They feel like they're doing a noble thing, right? But Peter says this, make every effort to add to your faith. And he said, and be all the more eager to make sure that you are adding to that faith. Because there is nothing more precious than that faith. Now, now here's the thing. I told him this morning about the rich man and Lazarus. I love that story. Isn't it, isn't it cool? That's a neat story. And, and in this life, Lazarus laid by the gate of the rich man. And the rich man, he had a, a good, a good, a whatever he wanted. And when they died, it says it like this. The rich man died and he went into torment and Lazarus died and the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. I love that part. I'm going to say that one more time real slow. The rich man died and he went to torment. And Lazarus died and the angels of the Lord carried him to Abraham's bosom. Now I ask you, which one was the rich man? Because one of them had invested in a priceless thing. And the other one had invested in a worthless thing. And we living in this life. And if this book right here is true, if this book right here is real, more people, a vast majority of people are going to hell. And they think it's mean that you tell them that. Right? And I don't understand that. Like a state cop pulled me over for going the wrong way on, a, on, a, on an exit ramp. And I never got mad at the guy because I was going the wrong way. I'd already figured it out because everybody else was going the other way. <laughs> but I didn't get mad at the old boy because the reality was, was I was going the wrong way, man. Right? And if he would have said, well, that old boy figured it out in a little while. I ain't got but a couple more hours on the shift. You know, I ain't fooling him. Well, that'd be stupid, wouldn't it? Because by the time I hit that semi coming, I'd have got her figured out. And, and, and the reality is, is the world thinks that books like this right here are trying to, to judge people. But Peter's, Peter's saying this, the Scripture's saying this, examine yourself. Examine yourself. I, like, I, I, don't have to, I don't have to judge Mike. I don't have to judge Crystal. I, I just got to weigh me in the balance. Is there fruit in my life? I mean, is, is God working? Is the Holy Spirit working? Is Derek Baker more in love with Jesus now than he was? Is he in control of my life? I mean, has he affected my friends? Has he affected my pastime? Has he affected my marriage? Has he affected my kids? Has he affected my bad habits? And has he affected my good ones? Right, because if he's not, where's the fruit? If I'm hooked to the vine, John 15 says, if I'm hooked to the vine, there's going to be some fruit. And if I'm not hooked to the vine, the problem's not with the vine. The problem's with the branch. And, and so it wasn't to be mean, man. The, 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 Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of salvation, for it will save those who call out to it. It is the, it's the salvation of humanity. Why be ashamed of it? Why apologize for the truth? Why apologize for this loving God? I said this morning, I want you to think about this for a minute because I want this message to be for those in Christ a message of hope and for those outside of Christ a, a challenge, a, a bold challenge. Why would you wait? I love the song, Just As I Am. I love music. I can't sing a lick, but I love music. But I love music that means something. Like they wrote, some, there's some songs out there wrote, secular songs, that I have no idea what they're about. I listened to the whole song and said, that guy right there said a bunch of words, didn't say the first dang thing. He just rambled on about a bunch of junk that don't mean nothing. But, but God didn't just ramble on. There's no filler in the Word of God, right? 
It was there for a purpose. And, and, and listen to the first line of just as, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Man, I love that. I love that. Church, do you realize your unworthiness? Do you realize that the grace that has been given to you was from the righteousness of Jesus Christ? That that's the faith, that the precious faith we have is what Jesus done for us. This morning I was listening to Gordon Moat sang the song, When Mercy Walked In. I love that song. And it's a courtroom scene. It's a courtroom scene. And the verdict is already passed. He's guilty. And the judge said, do you, want, do you have anything to say? And he said, and I was defenseless, but mercy walked in. That's when mercy walked in. Mercy walked in when I realized I was defenseless. That I had nothing to say. I couldn't claim innocence. I couldn't claim perfection. I couldn't claim anything. Man, I hung my head in guilt and mercy walked in. And I can just imagine that. I can imagine the judgment scene when everything I've done wrong is wrote on a piece of paper and every time Satan tries to recall one, Jesus takes that big blood-stained hand and one at a time Satan says he's a liar. He's a thief. He's a pervert. Every time Satan calls one off, he takes that blood-stained hand because you understand one thing, God can't see through the blood. And every time Satan says he's this, he swats that hand across them and says, I got that. I paid for that. Folks, that's the most precious thing in the world to me. And I cannot understand. I go to bed thinking about it. I wake up thinking about it. I don't understand why people who say they love God are not concerned about godliness. And I don't understand why somebody in love with Jesus ain't worried about fruit. Because I tell you about me, I don't want to lie to myself. I don't want to lie to myself. I don't want to put my faith in something that's no good. I got a little old pocket pistol I carry sometimes. The other day I got it out of my pocket, I said I might ought to clean that thing. It was jammed something off. And I said, boy, this right here is a good thing to put your faith in. I've packed around something right here. I might as well have had a good round rock in my pocket. It had been just as well off since. Right? I mean, because you got your security. Got it right here. It ain't worth nothing. I might as well have had a fork. You know what I mean? I have no, I had nothing. I, I, and, and what if people's faith is that way? What if they're packing around their old baptism certificate? Got it right here. What if they're not saved, you know? What if they're packing around the old Sunday school pen one year and never missed a day right here? They're packing around the old daddy was a deacon thing. Mama was a Sunday school. I went to church all my... I'm a good guy. Folks, all that is worthless. It's as worthless as a gun that won't shoot. It's worthless. Peter said, understand the preciousness of your faith. Because if you do this, if you add the fruit to your faith, you'll never fall. Have you ever had a greater guarantee than that? He's talking about apostasy there. If you're adding fruit to your faith, if you're headed toward the light with great determination, if it's come to the place where it means more to you than anything, if Jesus is going to be the definition of your marriage, if Jesus is the definition of how you raise your kids and how you spend your time and where you go and what you do and what you think, then you ain't going to fall. You may fall down, but you ain't going to fall from the faith. That's apostasy. You're not falling from the faith. But you'll receive a rich welcome into the kingdom of God. A sinner is, is all of us. A saint is a sinner that keeps crying, that keeps seeking, that keeps heading to that light. I'm not a saint because I'm perfect. I'm a saint because I'm in love with Jesus and he was. You know what I mean? I, 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 that's why I'm a saint. And, and so today in our, in our closing, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I want, I want to ask you something. Are you afraid of dying? Because I am. 
People say, I ain't afraid of dying. I tell you what, next time you run off the road and about to hit a big tree, if you get it under control, call me and ask me what emotion you had. Nobody ever says, there's a tree. <laughs> you know, oh my God, that's what you're going to say. Help me now, Lord, I need you. Right? I mean, I know where I'm going, but the transition process makes old Derek a little nervous. I let my kids talk me into riding a roller coaster a few years ago. Now, I ain't a big fan. And it had a sign before you got on it that said, this ride inverts. I have no idea what that meant then, but I do now. You know what I mean? <laughs> and when that thing turned upside down, everybody else was going, Woo! And I was saying, Jesus, if you give me office, I swear, I'll never get on it again. You know what I mean? <laughs> Thought it was over. You know what I mean? I am afraid of the transition. I need Jesus. I need him because I know that I am doomed to physically die. And I wasn't created to die. But I also know in Christ it's no big deal because I've been granted victory in Jesus. The transition may be scary. The destination is out of this world. It's awesome. I have a faith that's unbelievable. I believe every word in that book, and I believe there's only two destinations to go, and I know which one I'm going because of him, not because of me. But how can I say that I love a God I do not serve? And how can I say that I'm following a God and whom I'm getting farther away from? Think about that. How can you be following a God that you're getting farther away from? The reality is, is folks, we need to examine ourselves. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, I think it is, says examine yourself and see if you be in the faith. What is what I mean? Did he want us to pass? No, he didn't want us to pass the test. It's, let, let me read that verse. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test. You understand? If Christ Jesus is not in us, then we probably need to fail that test now. You know, I didn't realize how stupid I was till I got the test. Isn't that way you was in school? I mean, they'd set that test down in front of me, and I'd say, Lord have mercy. I don't really remember going over that. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't realize how little I knew until I realized what I was supposed to know. And then I was trying to figure out if that person beside me knew. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you can't copy off nobody in the throne room. Right? It ain't going to be nobody else up there but you and Jesus and God. It says the devil is constantly accusing you before the throne, so I guess he may be present. I don't know. What's he going to say? Because that's when mercy walked in. I want to tell you something. When it says my name in the book, all is under, it's one big blood stain. And I know it. I know the Holy Spirit lives in me. I'm not perfect. I ain't even close. But I know the Holy Spirit lives in me. And I wouldn't take nothing for that. And if you know it, praise His name. Praise his name. I mean, man, I got every reason to praise his name. I ought to be screaming from the rooftop. And so if you leave here today and you got a faith in Jesus and you are let down, something wrong. I mean, man, faith is precious, ain't it? And, 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 and hey, we ought to be more in, in love with Jesus and trying to add to our faith. And if you're saved and you've missed the mark, shoot again. Keep shooting. Don't, don't get discouraged. You missed the mark, but man, shoot again. Have fruit in the vine. And if you're here today and you're lost, I'm begging you by the sweet name of Jesus Christ. The same man that took your cross up Galgotha's hill and laid down and let him nail him to it. Why in the world would you walk out of this place without something that precious? Why in the world would you walk out? If we was giving away winning lottery tickets, you'd line up to get them, wouldn't you? I said, I guarantee you, this one right here is worth a hundred million. You think it'd be hard to get a line? Nah. But you start giving away Jesus, and people like walked the other way. 
What's precious to you? The most precious thing, Peter said. You've been given a faith as precious as ours. We're going to have an invitation here. This is the altar of God. I love that. You can come up here and cry out. You can sit where you are and cry out. You can get out on your knees where you are and cry out. You can sit down and there ain't no right and wrong way to do it. Some people laid prostate, which means they laid flat on the floor. If that's what you want to do, you get flat on the floor. If you get real still and somebody carries you out, just throw your hand up before they put you in the hearse or something. You know what I mean? But, uh, but it, you do what you want to do. But for the love of God, do what the Spirit leads you to do. Because wherever the Spirit goes, if you're going to follow it, you're going to have to go that way. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to shut up with this right here. Something that makes me cringe more than anything I've ever heard in the ministry is when people say, I wanted to go up, but I got afraid of what people would think. And I don't understand either side of that. First of all, if you're going to follow Jesus, people's probably going to think you're weird. Don't let that bother you. It ain't that bad after you get used to it. I've been weird all my life. All right? Follow Jesus. I guarantee you it's worth it. I, I promise you with every ounce of my soul it's worth it. Who cares what those people think? But if there's somebody in here and you went to Jesus and they thought it was funny that you did, they got bigger problems than you do. Don't worry about that. Man, if I find out after this service that out at Southside Church today, four people come up and cry out to Jesus for their Lord, if I don't get excited, I got some major problems. I need to be excited if somebody come to Jesus wherever they come to Jesus. If they knelt down in a fence row and come to Jesus, I need to be excited about it because that's my Lord. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as Lord, they say it'll be a party in heaven when you submit. And I'm going to do a little rejoicing here. So won't you come as we sing our invitation hymn?